We're gonna have a lot of fun today, Rady. I wanna start us off in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. If you have your Bibles with you, you can ch- turn to verse 27. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me, but I wanna be able to paint a picture for you. This will actually be the end of the story that sets up a, a framework for everything we're gonna be learning about today. But Genesis chapter 19, 27 through 29 says, Abraham got up early the, that morning and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah and watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities, like smoke from a furnace. Those cities had been completely destroyed. But I want you to get this last verse, verse 29. It said, but God listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities on the plain. He removed him from the disaster. We're gonna look a little bit today at how Lot ended up in the middle of a disaster. But before we get there today, I know there's some people in the room that might be in the middle of a disaster. They might be headed towards a disaster or by God's grace, you have a story that God has taken you out of disaster. And I came to remind you today, Radiant, that no matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, that our God is still able, he's still good, and he is still removing people from disasters even today. He still has, he still has a plan for your life and he's still in the salvation business. And I don't believe anybody ever makes a decision to be in a disaster, but I believe we all make decisions that over enough time could lead us to disaster. Nobody's ever woken up and said, today is the day I ruined my life. (laughs) But I believe in the decisions we make each and every day, we have the opportunity that we constantly drift towards disaster. I'm trying to catch some drifts today, right? And so that's why I titled my sermon, it's Catch Your Drift. Catch Your Drift. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, catch your drift. Yeah, you catch your drift. If you look up the meaning of the word drift, it means to aimlessly wander, to aimlessly wander. And you know some people that aimlessly wander through their lives. And it actually it sounds kind of nice because in, in a world today where we're go, 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 thing, 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 it feels nice to kind of let your mind aimlessly wander. But if you're not careful, it can get you into trouble, which is what happened to me uh, a couple months ago. And it was online shopping. All right, I'm not much of a shopper and I'm really not much of an impulse buyer, but uh, actually when I'm buying something, I usually have a plan. I stick to the plan. But a couple months ago in one conversation, one mention with my wife, I, I was talking about, I was thinking about getting a new wallet. And you know, as soon as you mention that anywhere near your phone, next time you get on social media, you start scrolling, it's just ad, 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 and wallets, so many wallet ads. And, and I'm hard-headed, like I'm stubborn. So I'm looking at these ads thinking, Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm-mm, they're not gonna get me on these ads until one did. (laughs) I got got by an Instagram ad. It was like they knew exactly what I wanted. It was a black leather, sleek wallet, plenty of room for cards. And here's the kicker of what got me. There's a little button on the side that if you click it, the cards popped up. (laughs) And I'm such a sucker. So I clicked on that ad and I went to the site and I looked at it and it was a little bit more expensive, more money than I wanted to pay. I'm thinking it's a wallet. You buy it once, you have it forever. So got the, uh, I got, add the cart or the, add the wallet to the cart. And then I go and I go to check out and another thing pops up and it's a GPS tracker. I can add a GPS tracker to this wallet. I think that's genius. <laughs> I lose my wallet all the time. This is perfect. I can add this GPS tracker. And I look at the price of it and it's almost as much as the wallet itself. So I'm thinking, how can I justify this expense? And then it hit me. <laughs> if I got wallet A, and I lost wallet A, then I would have to buy wallet B. But if I get the GPS tracker, I actually saved some money, you know? Not just a hat rack, ladies and gentlemen. So I add the GPS tracker to the cart and I go to check out. I'm a little ashamed at this point, right? I got got by an Instagram ad and then I'm going through and I'm adding my stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't want to spend this much money. So I add my card information. I add my shipping information and I click complete purchase and then one more thing pops up. And this one has a two minute timer attached to it and it's counting down. And it says, I have the opportunity to add a cash clip to my order for $15. They'll just throw it in there. If I just click the button in the next two minutes. Now I'm 28 years old. Like I I don't use cash. I use cards. I have Venmo. I have Apple Pay. Cash for a 28 year old is where money goes to die. (laughs) But there's something about a guy with a cash clip. (laughs) 
you know what I'm talking about. You respect a guy with a cash clip. When guy with a cash clip walks in, you know exactly who the guy with the cash clip is. He's funny, he's smart, he smells good. It's just, it's just how it is. When a guy with a cash clip, when he tells a joke at a party, <laughs> that joke absolutely hits. And so I'm imagining my life as cash clip guy. And there's 30 seconds left on this timer, and I'm wrestling with myself. Do I get the cash clip? I don't really need the cash clip. And it's, the, it's counting down. Five, four, three, two. Oh, no. I push that button. And to this day, <laughs> this cash clip has never held a dollar. They made it so easy <laughs> to drift from what I originally wanted. And this is the story of so many people. You know how I know that? <laughs> How clean is your car right now? Oh, you remember when you first got that car? You remember how you vacuumed it and you cleaned it and then a couple months went by and your kids drop goldfish crackers in the back seat and stuff starts to get cluttered and then the next thing you know, somebody goes to get in your front seat and you're shoving everything in the back saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to be able to clean it. Over time, we tend to drift from what we originally wanted. And for a lot of things in life, it's actually not that big of a deal. You're going to drift in a lot of things in life. But for the major things, if you find yourself drifting, you could be headed towards a disaster. If you drift in the cleanliness of your car, no big deal. But if you drift in your marriage, you have a couple arguments, things that left go unresolved, could be headed for disaster. You could make a couple impulse purchases, no big deal. But if you drift from God's best in your finances, you could be headed towards a disaster. And I'm, today, I'm telling you, I, I need some people to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to drift from God's best for my life. I'm not going to drift from what he has in store for my life. I'm not going to drift from God's best for my marriage. I'm not going to drift from God's best for my relationships, my finances, my friendships, my job, my career, my opportunities. I will not drift from God's best in my life. The stakes are too high. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Jordan. You can't drift from the very important things that God has called you to do. Because here's what happens if you drift from the major things in your life. There's consequences to those actions. I actually wrote it down this way. When you drift from God's best for your life, it'll take you farther than you ever thought you would stray. It'll keep you longer than you ever thought you would stay. And it'll cost you more than you ever thought you would pay. That's not the story of so many people. They just drifted and they've been taken farther than they ever thought. They kept longer than they ever thought and cost them more than they ever thought they would pay. But I believe the calling and the purpose that God has for your life is too great for you to have this story and to end up straying and drifting from what God has in store for your life. Because it's exactly what happened with Lot. Now we looked in chapter 19 where he had a disaster and God had to save it from it. But how did he get to the disaster? The roots of that story actually come from Genesis chapter 13. I want to be able to paint a picture of where we're at in Genesis 13 that'll, that'll take us to where we're going. We're going to talk about two guys today, Abraham and Lot. So you might have heard of Abraham before. God gave Abraham a promise in Genesis chapter 12 that he would be the father of many nations and that through him, he would be a blessing to nations beyond him. And he would give him a land that him and his descendants could live in forever. And so Abraham got that promise from God and he takes his nephew, Lot, and they go out in search of God's promised land. And where we're at in Genesis 13, we come to this where uh, Abraham and Lot had been traveling. Time had passed, and they'd actually gotten pretty wealthy. Like they'd been able to add a bunch of animals to their camp. They'd been adding servants to their camp. And what we find ourselves in right here in Genesis 13 is they're fighting, and they've decided I, we can't we can't fight like this. We're family. We have to be able to go our separate ways. And we're, we're going to read today in the story. You're going to see the names. You're going to see Abram and Lot. So Abram is Abraham, same guy. It's just Abram means exalted father. But God changes his name later in Genesis 17 into father of many nations. And if God changed his name, it's good enough for God. It's going to be good enough for me today. So if it changes a little bit when I'm talking, that's why that's the difference. So it says in Genesis 13, 10 through 18, Lot looked around and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like we saw in chapter 19. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the lot of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and set up his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north, south, east, and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. What a promise. 
I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone can count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So Abraham went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he set up his tents. There he built an altar to the Lord. Now there's a lot in that story, but there's three things that we can specifically pull out that will help you catch your drift in your life. Number one, fix your eyes. You have to fix your eyes to catch the drift in your life. In verse 10, you can see it says, Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of Eden, or like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set up towards the east. Do I have anybody that would consider themselves a bad driver in the room? (laughs) Very few people will consider themselves bad drivers. Your spouse might have looked at you when I asked that, but nobody calls themselves a bad driver. I don't believe in bad drivers. I believe in distracted drivers, and I'm one of those distracted drivers. I've got a little like touch of the ADD, so when I'm driving, I, I notice everything else except for the road in front of me. And honestly, moving to Florida has been the worst for me because I love looking out over the water. And so I find myself sometimes driving down Bayshore and I'm looking out over the water and I see those houses on Davis Island, you know, one of the ones I'm talking about. And I imagine my life in those houses. And I imagine being out on the, the back, looking out over the water, right by my pool, grilling out, kiss the cook apron on, right? You have the whole picture now in your head. And I find myself while I'm in fantasy land dreaming about my life on Davis Island that in real life, my car is drifting to where my eyes <laughs> are going. <laughs> Don't you know this to be true that where your eyes go, where your eyes drift, everything else tends to follow. And this is exactly what happened with Lot. He looked across and saw the great plains. He saw that it was like the garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt. And he made a decision with his eyes without ever consulting what God would want to do in his life. And here's my fear today, Radiant Church, is that we've made far too many decisions with our eyes. We never asked if that's what God wants us to do. This lives in direct opposition to the, the way that God has called us to live, which is by faith. And Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the picture that says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. A life of faith doesn't make decisions with its eyes. And I think sometimes we think we're living a life of faith because we're looking at all around, we're deciding things that we want, and then we're going to God and asking him to bless it for us. But God's not a genie in a bottle that will grant you wishes. No, no, a life of faith goes to God and says, who do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And then when God speaks, you move. That's the life of faith, is that you hear from God and then you fix your eyes on what he says and that's what you walk to. If it was up to Abraham's eyes, he would have never went to the promised land. (laughs) He lived a good life. He didn't need to go, but he heard from God and fixed his eyes. It was up to Moses' eyes. He would have never led the Israelites out of Egypt, but he heard from God and he fixed his eyes and walked in obedience. If it was up to Jesus' eyes, He would have never went to the cross. Why would he go to the cross? But we see where he says, not my will, but your will be done. He fixed his eyes and went to the cross in obedience. Living a life of faith doesn't make decisions with our eyes. It hears from God and then fixes our eyes on what he says. Because here's the truth today, Radiant. Your eyes, they'll deceive you. (laughs) They did Lot. Lot looked across. Garden of Eden, land of Egypt. He pictured the two greatest things that he could even wrap his mind around. But those two cities ended up being Sodom and Gomorrah, two of the most morally corrupt cities to have ever existed in all of human history. It was so shiny, so nice on the outside, but on the inside, it was rotten to the core. Your eyes, they're going to deceive you, but here, here's the truth today, Radiant. God's word will not. God's word will not deceive you. When you live a life of faith and you fix your eyes on what God says, I'm telling you, you live differently. I fix my eyes on God's word. I fix my eyes on obedience. I fix my eyes in worship. I fix my eyes in prayer. I fix my eyes by being in church each and every week, not because it's the right thing to do. 
It's the only way that I know how to live. And faith is not in what is seen, but it is what is unseen. And so when I'm walking through times in my life where I'm walking through darkness and I don't know the next step and I don't know where to go, it's okay because God has directed me through his word and in worship and in people around me. So I don't need to see the next step in front of me. I just have to know and trust that God is directing me in faith. Because I don't go on what I see. I go on what God is telling me to do. So you've got to fix your eyes. The second thing you have to do to catch your drift is to watch your step. You've got to watch your step. It says, Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and set up his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. It's no big deal, right? <laughs> Lot moved into a bad neighborhood. Big deal. Last week, my wife and I were able to get away and we were actually at a resort uh, staying for a couple days. And this resort was one that had an unbelievable amount of pools, like big pools, small pools, kiddie pools, lazy rivers. It was like Oprah designed this place. It was like, you get a pool and you get a pool and you get a pool. So to go anywhere, to walk anywhere at this resort, you had to walk near a pool. So to walk to your room, you had to go near a pool. To go get a snack, you had to go near a pool. To go to the bathroom, you had to go in the pool. N- near, the, <laughs> near, the, near the pool. Don't act like you've never done it. <laughs> you had to go near the pool. And this resort is one where if you go, like you, you hang out all day by the pool and then you go get ready for dinner and they have all these restaurants all over the property. And so one night me and my wife were walking to dinner and we see this couple that were walking near a pool. And this couple was dressed to the nines, right? They were about to have the greatest meal of their entire vacation. The the woman looked like she had spent hours getting ready, hair done, makeup done, the whole thing. The problem was she was walking a little too close to the edge of a pool. (laughs) You know where this one is going. And it just took one wrong step in her five inch heels and her arms start to flail. You know, it's like a slow motion in a bad movie. Somebody could have caught her. I am convinced somebody could have caught her from falling in that pool, but everybody wanted to see her do it. And so she falls boom, lands in the pool, hair ruined, makeup ruined, night ruined. And it's really not that funny until you get around the corner (laughs) and then you can laugh and then it's very funny what happened to her. I I noticed something thinking about that story is that I have never, not one time, ever fallen into a pool that I was not near. In fact, I, I crunched some numbers for you. I wrote it down. I'm kind of a math genius, so I didn't want you to have to work on anything. You are 100% more likely to fall into something if you are near it than if you are not. It's probability. Ladies and gentlemen, I got something I want to be able to show you here. You are 100% more likely to fall into something than if you are, if you are near it than if you are not. And this is exactly where Lot found himself. See, he had left a life of freedom. He was with his uncle Abraham and he wasn't living in sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. He just found himself right here, right on the edge of sin, just towing the line of sin. The problem is when he's near it, eventually he might end up in it. And we see in, in, in chapter 19, right before the disaster in Genesis 19, it says the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and where was Lot? Sitting in the gateway of the city. Man. When you're near something, you are one step from being in something. When you are near something, you are one step away from being in something. And this is the pattern that I think a lot of us find ourselves in. You see, you never drift towards freedom. There's never been one time where I've had a conversation with somebody who was formerly addicted to something. They said, I don't know how it happened. I kind of just woke up and addiction broken. No, 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 no. You always will drift towards sin. It's our human nature. We will always be drifting towards sin. But we end up right here, toe in the line, right between freedom and sin. And it's amazing how we can justify this stuff in our minds and the patterns that we find ourselves in. It's like, uh, I work really hard for this company. I, what's the big deal? I take a couple personal expenses on the company card. It's not that big of a deal. And all of a sudden, boom. You find yourself in sin. Or here's my favorite uh, uh, people in the church. These are ladies in the church and, they'll, and they'll, be, they'll be talking and they'll be like, did you hear about Margaret and her husband? They're going through a rough time and their marriage, you should be praying for them. But really, you're not, it's not a prayer request. This is gossip and they fall <laughs> into sin. Or here's, here's my favorite one. It's, it's people talking. They're like, I can't understand. I don't know why I keep drinking and doing stupid stuff. 
It's like, well, what are your friends doing? Well, they drink and they do stupid stuff. <laughs> and you end up falling into sin over and over again, and it's a pattern, and we keep having to fall into sin, we're like, God, please help us, and then we'll go back over to freedom, he'll save us, but then we find ourselves where? Towing the line, right here, right here, towing the line between freedom and sin, because when you are near sin, (laughs) you are one step away from living in sin. It's the pattern over and over and over again. We find ourselves right here, towing the line, so how do we break the pattern? Proverbs 4, 14 through 15. I need you to see it. It says, do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your own way. Look at the language. Avoid it. Don't even travel on it. It's not like, well, if you think you can kind of handle it, If you think you're strong enough, if you think you're stronger than those people, then you could probably get away with it. No, no, no. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. And oh, this proverb is so helpful because it showed me this. I didn't realize it because it says you can turn from it and go on your own way. Because when we're living right here, when you're one step from being, when you're near something, you're one step from being in something. And usually that means if I'm near sin, I'm one step away from being in sin. But there's another option this proverb tells us that when I'm near freedom, I'm one step away from being in freedom. I don't think you heard me, Radiant, because this is a story of so many people at Radiant Church, is that I was living a pattern over and over again. I couldn't figure it out. My marriage, my family, my friendships, my patterns of life that I couldn't figure it out. But then I heard about Jesus at Radiant Church, and I made the decision to step and walk in freedom. And then I heard about next steps, and that was the best way to get plugged into community. I took another step. Boom, next steps. And then I heard about groups and that was the best way to be able to meet people. Boom, and all of a sudden you find yourself from one right step walking in freedom and all that God had called him to do. Can you give him better praise, Radiant Church? It just takes one right step. You're one wrong step from being in sin. It takes one right step to be able to walk in freedom. So if you gotta fix your eyes, you've gotta watch your step, the last one to be able to catch your drift, so you mark your moment. You mark your moment. It's the greatest way to catch the drift that's in your life. It says in Genesis 13, 14, the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had parted from him, look around you from where you are, north, south, east, west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. It's amazing. Even if Abraham had a moment of doubt and that whole interaction with Lot, they were in the promised land. They were there. And Lot had chosen to go take over a portion of it. Can you imagine the thoughts that are running through Abraham's mind? What if he took the promise? What if I'm missing out? What if I missed out on God's best for my life? And after it happened, oh, after, it wasn't in the middle of it. It was after Abraham had to walk in faith. He reiterates the promise, such an incredible promise that was on Abraham's life. It would be such a shame if he drifted from that promise, fell away from it, and never experienced God's best for his life. So how does Abraham do it? How does he never drift? How does he stay constant in the promise to be able to see it through, the promise that God has for his life? The answer is in verse 18. It says that he went to live near the great trees of Mamre, at Hebron where he set up his tents. And here it is, there he built an altar to the Lord. An altar to the Lord. Now I don't know how familiar you are with Old Testament altars, but Abraham, he would go and build these when he, had, he was marking a significant moment where God had spoke to him. You can see it throughout his life, that when God speaks, Abraham would take the time, he would make an altar so he could remember the moment. And across the Old Testament, there's different things that people use to be able to build uh, build these altars, and later on they build them out of stone, or they build them out of precious metals like gold. But in Abraham's time, he was moving from place to place to place across this region, and so he was probably getting on his knees, using his hands to build these altars out of dirt. I can't imagine him thinking through the moments that he had had with God, and his response was to be able to mark that moment, build the altar to remember the faithfulness of God, and that's the real reason 
why Abraham never drifted. He never found himself falling away from the promise of God because he always remembered the faithfulness of God. He never let himself forget it. Lot did. Lot looked across, made the decision with his eyes, looked as close to the sin cities as possible. Abraham waited, trusted, obeyed, and when he heard from God, he marked the moment to where he wasn't gonna forget how faithful God had been in his life. In the summer of 2021, my wife and I were on the verge of the biggest faith step we had ever taken. We were Midwest kids, born, raised, got married, bought a house. In the summer of 2021, we made the decision in faith to be able to move to Tampa to join a church called Radiant. And I remember we were packing up our, all the stuff in our house and we were just talking about what it was gonna look like. And it was a massive, massive faith step and we were terrified. I mean, God was in the entire process, but it doesn't make it any less scary. So we were talking through and we were moving away from family farther than we'd ever been from family before. We were moving to Tampa. We didn't know a ton of people in Tampa. And in all honesty, I was thinking, man, the people at Radiant are so talented. People that work at Radiant, I don't think you know how talented they are. People that serve at Radiant, they're so stinking talented. I was worried. I want to cut it. And I'd be making the biggest, the biggest mistake of my life. And I'd have to run back home with my tail between my legs, knowing that I just made the worst decision I'd ever made. As we're packing our stuff, talking about some of these fears that night, my wife pulls out a little bag of dirt that was in one of our bins that we kept little things in. She's like, what's this? I thought back to where I got that. I honestly forgot I even had it. But three years earlier, in 2018, I went to a church conference. And I don't remember much about what that guy spoke on that night, but I remember the moment I had with God. He, re- he reiterated the call that he had on my life, the purpose, the passion that was deep within me. He, he brought up to life some dreams that honestly I thought were dead and dormant. So that night I heard that message and at the end of the guy's message, he had all these bags of dirt laid across the front of the stage. So I went up and grabbed one, be able to mark the moment of what God had done in my life that night. And by God's grace, I somehow took it home on the plane, got through TSA with, <laughs> with a bag of dirt and they didn't question it. <laughs> But I couldn't help but think when we found that bag of dirt packing our house that night in 2021, how thankful I was for the faithfulness of God. It was almost like that entire encounter in 2018 where I grabbed that bag of dirt, I took it home with me, was for that moment in 2021 where I was forgetting the faithfulness of God and forgetting what he had done in my past. And he was reminding me once again, I've been faithful before. I'll be faithful in front of you. You still have a passion. You still have a plan. I still have a future ahead of you. It just took a moment to remember the faithfulness of God. I think today, some people at Radiant need to remember how good God's been to you, how faithful he's been. I wrote it down this way, for somebody who's struggling, can't see what God is doing, when you don't know what God has next, you've gotta remember the moment he spoke last. You've gotta remember the moment. And I don't know what that looks like for you. It could be at Radiant Church, you've had a moment. Steal one of those pins. (laughs) Take one of those Radiant pins home. Fill out two connect cards. I don't know what it looks like, but you have to know how to mark moments where God has shown himself faithful. Has he not been good to you? Has he not put breath in your lungs? Has he not put a purpose on your life? Has he not given you people to surround yourself with? Has he not given you a hope and a future and a plan to be able to move forward in? Has God not been faithful in anybody's life today at Radiant Church? Take some time, mark a moment, remember where God has been faithful. And when you do, It's impossible to drift. It's the anchor for our soul. We remember the faithfulness of God. I can't drift from God's best for my life. And I remember he's been faithful in my past. He's faithful now. and He'll be faithful in my future. Would you join me today in prayer, Radiant? There's two groups of people that I wanna take a moment and be able to pray for. First one, you feel like you're just drifting through life right now. Maybe you're in the middle of a disaster. 
Maybe you don't know what, what life looks like ahead of you. Maybe it's dark. You don't know the steps that are needed to go forward. There's a God that's been faithful to you. And even if you can't remember it, there's a God that sent his son 2,000 years ago to show himself faithful to you. And there's times where it just takes a moment. So that's what I want to be able to do today. If that's you and you would say, I just need a reminder of the faithfulness of God. I don't need you to raise your hand or anything. Just put your hand over your chest. Just as a sign to say, Lord, would you remind me again? Remind my soul that you've been faithful, that you've been true, that there's never been a moment where you have left me or forsaken me, but you have been right near me the entire time. And even when I've drifted far, you never have. You've stayed steady and consistent. So Lord, would you remind some people today of your faithfulness? Second group of people that I would take a moment and pray for. And those are people who might, might not have a relationship with Jesus. You've never made that decision and you've been living a life where you've been towing the line between freedom and sin. You keep falling in the same patterns over and over and over again. Today's a day to take the step towards freedom. There's a God who loves you and has a perfect plan for your life. There's something that separates us between that us and God. That's sin, the sin that just eats out our lives, but there's a solution for your sin. God sent him and his son, Jesus. And Jesus lived the life we couldn't live, died the death that we deserve to die, was risen three days later so that you and I could have eternal hope in the son of God and we could have salvation and live with him forever. There's some people in this room that need to make that decision today and you've been feeling God stir at your heart and today is your moment to be able to step in that freedom. So that's you. I'm gonna ask you to make a simple and bold decision. When I count to three, would you slip your hand up in the air just to acknowledge it? We're not gonna call you out. We're not gonna do anything. We're gonna pray a simple prayer of faith knowing that you're coming into the family of God today. So if that's you, would you make that, make that decision today to follow Jesus? If that's you, you can raise your hand. One, two, three. You can go ahead and raise your hand. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say this prayer out loud and together radiant. Dear Jesus, today I make a decision to follow you. Forgive me my past, my present, and my future. Thank you for dying for me. Today I choose to live for you. Be my Lord, be my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Radiant, can you join me in celebrating those who just made the best decision ever.